Wallace, namaste. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm well. Happy to see you. Excuse me? I'm happy to see you. I'm doing well. Um, I'm, happy, I'm happy to be here. This should be very interesting. Definitely. <clears throat> we, we have um, the Bhaktivedanta Institute uh, has some uh, history in, with you and, of course, uh, Sripad Bhakti Madhava Pori Maharaj um, from the early days of the gwfhegel.org site, um, which I know um, Sripad Pori Maharaj and some other Hegelian scholars made around 1997. And I know you also played a role in that. I saw one of your papers uh, is listed there. And from there, you had some uh, other a Hegelian group study going on via email lists. And, um, and then finally in 2019, uh, you actually came here to New Jersey to Rutgers University and participated in our conference, the Science and That's Scientist right. Conference. So um, right. before we get into the discussion, would you care to share any reflection on, on those things? Oh, <laughs> I remember long, fascinating discussions with Dr. Puri around the turn of the century. Um, he taught me a lot about Vedanta um, and we had uh, ex, you know, detailed discussions of Hegel, which were uh, very helpful to me. So um, um, that was great. The, the conference in New Jersey was fascinating. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I feel that uh, many of these discussions um, need to reach a, a wider audience, essentially, and uh, we've got to figure out how to do that. We're, you know, making a humble effort in that direction with this study. Uh, we have it on Substack. We have a blog on Substack. Yes. We try to share on the social media outlets. So whatever our very finite capacity is, we're trying to share these things with others. We oh, also have the Hegel group on Facebook. This is such a nice group. That's right. I mean, I think your efforts are, are um, wonderful. Um, and of course, our Hegel, <laughs> our Facebook Hegel group uh, has a lot of members. but. Um, um the broader discussion in the in the media um i should say in the traditional media i suppose um print media the uh, new york times and and um uh, you know magazines of 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 opinion um very seldom even touch on these issues that interest us so much. I mean, they, they tend to assume that uh, religion is, um, is uh, a personal matter or it's strictly a matter in uh, something in the past. Uh, and so um, a serious dialogue between science and religion just doesn't happen um, in, the, in those domains. And um, you know, George Wald might have opened it up <laughs> 30 years ago, but um, because of his Nobel Prize and so forth, I mean, he, uh, he, he, he got uh, some publicity. But um, um, in general, uh, leading scientists nowadays um, dismiss philosophy as well as religion, right? <laughs> this is so common, and they very seldom get much of a response. Yes, it's very uh, interesting. You brought up George Wald. Are, are you aware of his connection with our institute? Yes, yes, I know. I, it's a fascinating story. Ah, <laughs> yes, um, it's quite miraculous, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, would you like to say anything about your two books before we move on to the study here? Oh, I just, uh, <clears throat> I mean, if, if you're going to put the, uh, the detail, publication details I will, yes, in I the video somewhere, that's all we really need. I mean, my first book uh, is entirely about Hegel. Um, 
from uh, 2005, and my second book um, is about Plato and Hegel and many of their uh, successors into the 20th century. Um, and in both cases, I both books, I address the um, relationship between religious thinking and scientific thinking, um, which is very much Hegel's theme. So uh, um, not every Hegel scholar um, embraces the whole thing, but I do. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I, I hope uh, the books will be helpful to people who want to uh, um, get into more detail on the issues that Dr. Puri raises very well in his short book. Um, that we are, we are hand in hand in effect. And uh, one of those things that you are hand in hand with, which I, I feel is so important, is uh, understanding Hegel in the context that he presents himself as coming in the, the line of thought that Plato and Aristotle come in instead of other lines of thought, which maybe public perception of Hegel tend to throw him in, although that's maybe not so accurate. Uh, you you understand him in Plato's and Aristotle's line. Yes, well, you know, of course, uh, Hegel is known supposedly as the source of of uh, important part of Karl Marx's thinking. Um, in fact, uh, this is a this is an illusion created by Karl Marx, <laughs> um, and um, um, I mean, insofar as Marx is a humanitarian. Uh, the two of them have a good deal in common, clearly. But uh, Marx's notion of the, the so-called dialectic is completely different from Hegel's. So um, there's really no, uh, no great continuity there at all. And Hegel's interests, um, as we just said, uh, have to do with the relation between science and religion, uh, which is a, top, a dead issue for, for Marxists. So in um, the video that we made trying to present this last part of uh, Tripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj's book, um, in the beginning, we make the, the point that uh, public perception sometimes says about science and religion, uh, that science deals with how and religion deals with why about reality, how reality happens, how nature unfurls that is science's domain and why reality or nature uh, exists. That's the domain of religion. And that's an incredibly superficial uh, thing to think, but it's helpful in that it points to the role that thought plays, that thought itself plays in both of these arenas, science and religion. So I wanted to ask you, um, what is your understanding between these two faculties of, of the human being, thought and consciousness? Because I know this is, uh, is, I think, important going forward so that we start with this. Oh, I thought um, Dr. Puri's um, beginning his chapter with this distinction between questions about how and questions about why. Um, I don't think you need to apologize. <laughs> I think this is, a, this is a very illuminating way of thinking about the relation between um, um, science and religion. Um, so, and um, Dr. Puri's efforts throughout the chapter to reintroduce or show how we can unify those two kinds of question are, are really uh, admirable and, and central. I mean, if we can't, if we can't uh, take seriously questions about why, about purposes, um, then we can't take religion seriously. And there's no discussion uh, the, the, between the two domains. Um, and unfortunately, um, beginning with Francis Bacon, as Dr. Puri points out, um, 
modern science has systematically excluded questions about why and about purposes, uh, the formal cause and the final cause in Aristotle's terms. Um, and it's difficult, uh, as I said a moment ago, to, to, um, to persuade uh, admirers of science and I mean, modern science has an amazing accomplishments, um, absolutely over amazing accomplishments uh, to its credit. So uh, that's what they're, you know, we're all impressed by those. <laughs> um, and we, um, uh, it's not difficult for um, people to think, well, that must mean that uh, we can't really think uh, in any systematic or useful way about purposes, because science doesn't do that, supposedly. Um, and so, um, uh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it can't be done. That's the, uh, that's the common assumption. Thanks. Definitely. So, as you mentioned, Francis Bacon, not only did he uh, very intentionally eliminate the uh, formal and final cause and emphasize the material and efficient cause uh, in, Arist in Aristotle's terms. But he also uh, you know, said, we are not concerned with ourself. We're not concerned with the role of the self in our scientific endeavor. Um, and so he you know, planted the seed for a science that knows nothing about the scientist the role of the scientist in science. We're making these observations of, of nature, but what role does thought play? What role does consciousness play in these observations? Uh, and those questions aren't asked at all. And, and those are the questions that then help us to approach that big why, the purposes. Um, many times Dr. Pori emphasizes uh, that the formal and the final cause are very much related to each other. And he, he says it in such a nice way that um, the purpose that a thing serves is the reason that it came to be, right? The purpose that a thing serves, the final cause is, is the reason that it came to be the formal, the formal agency, right? So these two things are uh, fundamental to anything in nature, let alone uh, any, any, any thought. What, what role does thought play? I mean, that, that is the role that thought plays. There is some uh, lacking in, in the experience of a conscious agent. There is some lacking and that gives rise to a desire and, and the desire to fill that lacking. And, and that gives rise to so many things created, technology, medicine, right? We have some lacking to overcome suffering. We are experiencing suffering. There's some lacking. How do we overcome this suffering? Well, let's, you know, now we have this, this drive to, to search and make medicines. Let's figure out how the body works. Let's figure out how these plants and nature work. Let's figure out how to manipulate them in a way that, you know, makes the body uh, not suffer in the ways that we're experiencing. So this is all in the milieu of conscious activity, of thought. It's derived from there and, um, you know, all the materialistic side to it is derivative of that thinking activity. So how to, how to study that, um, you know, this is central to both science and religion, how to study thought. Well, as your conferences have pointed out, um, science, science's systematic activity uh, neglects the scientist herself, um, <laughs> which is, um, if you were to seriously, if science were to seriously consider the activity of the scientist, um, they would have to, it would have to uh, explore what is thought. Science is an activity of thought. Uh, how is it that uh, scientists are able to uh, pursue truth um, rather than merely survival, for example. I mean, uh, 
Darwinian biology is all about the survival of, of um, genes, um, re their reprodu self-reproduction. Uh, how is it that beings, living beings, certain living beings, are interested not merely in survival and reproduction, but in the truth? I mean, this is something that um, Darwinian uh, the line of thought simply can't address, and so it doesn't. Um, and that's what um, that's where modern science meets its limits. It doesn't consider itself in a serious way. One of the uh, one of the many drawbacks of Darwinian evolution that concept is the fact that it asserts that matter is the result uh, is from, uh, it says that life comes from matter, that life is first matter and then spontaneously matter uh, becomes a living thing. And it doesn't account for consciousness, the role of consciousness at all. Um, and so even in mainstream science actually, as Dr. Corey many times points out, uh, you know, essentially largely starting from the work of um, Nobel laureate Barbara McClintock, uh, the cognitive role of the cell and, and how that affects the genome and how that affects the organism's development uh, has become you know, something that can't be ignored anymore, such that it's coming from Barbara McClintock, uh, you know, James Shapiro. Uh, Barbara McClintock is no longer on this planet, uh, but James Shapiro is carrying forward that work. Um, he calls it the read-write genome. Not only is the genome uh, reading, you know, proofreading, but it's writing, it's editing. The cell is editing its own genome when it encounters uh, some un uh, unforeseen obstacle. It is able to consciously adapt itself to overcome that obstacle, and um, and others are following that work, such as Dennis Noble uh, from Oxford. And you can see actually just last year, uh, Dennis Noble had a debate uh, on the Voice of Oxford, the Vox website, with the biggest proponent on this planet of Darwinian evolution, uh, you know, um, Richard Dawkins. And, and interestingly, Noble, uh, Dennis Noble is actually was the PhD advisor of, of Richard Dawkins when he was in, uh, doing his doctorate at Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> and so these two are debating each other, uh, and Dennis Noble is representing much of what Barbara McClintock and James Shapiro and that stream of science, cognitive science, the role of the cognitive cell, he's representing that and, and the implications that has. Uh, and, and, you know, you can see uh, how that conception completely uh, you know, makes Darwinian evolution an embarrassment. And you can see those things online, that, that video is, is up there online. And, so these things are very important, uh, how to acknowledge the cognitive activity in all living things from cells to organisms and how on different scales uh, that affects reality from you know, cells and organisms to the human being, right? The, the, what Hegel points out is, is second nature, right? In the human being, the second nature starts to emerge in human beings. It's not just, uh, this type of nature that we find in animals where it's basically sleeping, uh, mating, defending, and eating, there is this other level where they can, human beings can inquire about the self, can inquire about why, can start to approach these kinds of questions. So this is, you know, from, all, from many different angles, uh, this is make, having momentum, is, is moving forward and is becoming very important. Thank you for underlining that. It's fascinating how within experimental biology itself, there is this uh, non-mechanistic line of thought, um, which um, again, doesn't get a lot of publicity and the general, and the general public is not aware of it, but uh, um, people, people in biology are, are aware of it. And um, um, I mean, biology has always been the difficult issue for materialism, right? Um, because um, 
um, the origin of life is something that purely materialistic determinism doesn't seem to be able to address effectively at all. And they, <laughs> this is fairly widely admitted at the moment. I mean, we're just waiting for <laughs> another breakthrough, right? The, the mechanistic materialism is dreams that eventually um, it will successfully address the question of how life originates. Um, and uh, who knows? Maybe it will. Maybe it will succeed in some to some degree. But uh, but it's remarkable that after a century and a half of Darwinian biology, that question is still completely unsettled, unresolved, um, and that is undoubtedly has something to do with the fact that life. I mean, we don't have to say that it involves cognition. Essentially, it, it involves purposive organization, right? And and a mechanism as such is not purposive. It gets its purposes from outside itself if it has any purposes at all. So the fact that um, bio living things are purposive is a standing challenge to mechanistic materialism. So one point um, that. Dr. Pori makes in the first chapter, which gets revisited throughout the book, is that this distinction, right, that Hegel makes between outer and inner purpose or outer and inner teleology. Right. So in the organisms, it's all an internally motivated purpose. The, the development of the organism as a whole is happening from within. And there have been attempts, experiments to uh, you know, manipulate or try to make that process deviate in some way, and it returns. It actually goes back to that normal development. Like they, you know, they had two uh, what was it uh, sea urchins, and it was a single sea urchin, and and the embryo was there, and they split it in half, thinking you know maybe it would just stop. You know, the development wouldn't happen, but instead the development kept on going as two two sea urchins, right? So it's it's uh, in other experiments where they try to you know, change um, an aspect of the embryo and, and will that make an organism develop in an awkward way? And still somehow this, uh, this it's not homeostasis, but it, it always is goal-directed. It's a goal-directed development. And even if you try to manipulate that goal externally, it still reaches that internally determined goal, even if you try to manipulate it from the outside. So you know, yes. that, that is not something machines do. <laughs> yes, so hopefully <laughs> these, um, this non-mechanistic biology that we're discussing will eventually uh, find its counterpart in a non-mechanistic understanding of human beings, right? <laughs> um, which would complete the story and we'd be understanding scientists in a non-mechanistic way we'd be understanding ourselves in a non-mechanistic way and that would be the final um, overcoming of francis bacon's dismissal of aristotle i mean we'd be we'd be able to have a useful discussion with aristotle once more about the role of purpose um, and thought in nature. So one part of this uh, chapter that uh, Dr. Corey, um, he, he describes the difference between thought and consciousness. And, and then to me, it, it was in a way that was super clear and it helped my understanding become clarified tremendously um, how when thought takes itself as its own object, when it, when it thought thinks about itself, it takes itself to be its own object, but it's, it, it's not self-conscious. So it becomes, these, it becomes consciousness where there's an object and a subject that are apparently opposed to each other. And so, this consciousness is 
is basically defined by this duality between a subject and an object, which are both within thought, but it might not be known to thought immediately. And so anything that we talk about uh, in nature as being objective, as being an object, has this fundamental relationship with a subjective agent. And the development of that relationship between the subject and object going from something strictly uh, materialistic where uh, the object is, is seen as the real thing in nature and whatever subjective perceptions we have of that object don't influence it at all and, and are basically irrelevant mm -hmm. to higher development where we're seeing that as Sripad Puri Maharaj would say, the object is what the subject knows it to be in that the subject is determining the object to a large extent. And then further, the object itself is also determining the subject's perception of it in this interpenetrating way. And so this development between the subject-object relationship as it continues to uh, become more comprehensive and more all-encompassing so that that duality, that isolated perception of things in a world that aren't related to each other and have nothing to do with thought, slowly that illusion you know, fades and we start to have this more holistic dynamic uh, understanding where things are both unified and they're also uh, diverse from each other, where there's an identity be between things and there's also uh, a difference between them. So it's more of this dialectic uh, relationship and this dialectic mode of thought that needs to be adopted to make progress in that way. And of course, uh, Hegel, you know, this is what Hegel is contributing to this field, I think. What would you say about that? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, um, in these very abstract terms, um, the, the, uh, the issue of the relation between subject and object has been uh, ongoing in modern philosophy since Descartes, primarily, who yeah. really put it on the on the map with his distinction between a thinking thing and an extended thing, and the extended things are all the material objects, um, which he proposed could be understood um, mechanistically, and indeed he described uh, uh, non-human animals as machines. I mean, consistently. So everything in the in the realm of extended, uh, all, all the extended things were going to be purely mechanical and not engaged in thought, right? Not capable of thought. Thought was was a, an entirely separate domain, um, and the, <laughs> this is his. Um, his version of Francis Bacon's uh, new ontology, that science was going to be purely about machines, essentially. Um, and uh, Descartes was um, um, broad-minded enough to realize that uh, th thinking about machines is not going to explain thought. Right. So he gave it, he gave thought this entirely separate domain, the thinking things as opposed to the extended things. And as a result, um, uh, he wasn't able to explain any how those two domains could interact. Uh, that's the problem of subject and object, as you, as we put it in these very abstract uh, Kantian or Hegelian terms. It's all the same permanent. Uh, unsolved issue of um, modern science. Um, and you're right that um, that is Hegel's primary, well, one of his primary concerns is to overcome that duality. Um, and uh, Dr. Puri is right, of course, um, in focusing on that. Um, 
how Hegel proposes to overcome that duality is a pretty complicated issue in, in his text and his science of logic and his encyclopedia. Hello, hello. How are you? How are you doing, Mom? <laughs> Great to see you, Dr. Puri. Bill, how are you doing? I'm very, I'm just fine, thanks. I'm enjoying this discussion very much. Oh, good. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm treating Krishna Keshava, you know, as a student who wants to learn philosophy by throwing him in the ocean and letting him learn how to swim. <laughs> well, he's he's doing very well. <laughs> you have a wonderful assistant there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So what have you? What have you been in Wisconsin? I understand. Huh? Excuse me. You're now in Wisconsin. I'm in Wisconsin for the summer. Arizona. Uh, how are people living? Arizona there? in the winter. <laughs> how are people living there in Arizona? with 120 degrees temperature. Well, electricity makes it possible, right? Without electricity, it would, it doesn't, it the place would just be a desert. Yeah, it doesn't seem possible to me, 120 degrees every day, for a whole month, actually. Yes, quite quite amazing. Um, Any other? <laughs> the, uh, if our friends are, are uh, you know, it, it's, they say it's no different from surviving the winter in the north. <laughs> the same same thing in kind of mirror image. So, and so, we've spent, we've spent summers in Arizona as well. It can be done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mainly thanks to electricity and air conditioning, yeah, obviously. But well, you have to go out sometime. <laughs> well, yes, and that's a challenge. Yeah, that's a challenge. I'm glad you have glad you have a home there in Wisconsin too. Right. Thank you. Well, we, it's so green here. It's amazing. Yes. So <laughs> rather than depending on electricity, we have water and living things. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you something. I, I don't know. I don't want to interfere with what you're talking about. If, uh, you know, I just, I don't want to interfere with what you were talking about. Oh, I'm sure you can leap right in. What was your, what was, what did you want to know? Uh, a couple of things. Do you want to, I never see you mention Albert Turkin. Do you know who he is? Oh, yes. A uh, wonderful guy. Do you know him too? Well, I've seen his papers. He's very much focused on the true infinite. That's right. That's right. We yeah. met once face to face and we've corresponded and I'm, I'm, Eager to to uh, get together with him again. He's a wonderful thinker. Okay, <laughs> very wide uh, terms of reference. Where is he? Where is he uh, teaching? Well, he's. I don't think he teaches primarily. I think he's involved in uh, 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 tech entrepreneurship of some kind. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. and he travels a lot. Um, he taught, I think he's taught off and on in Istanbul. I see, okay. Yeah. Turk, Turkish, I guess. Turkish. Right. Turkish. right. Okay, right. Well, very good. And the yeah. other thing is, um, I've been thinking about the difference between the logical idea of life that Hegel presents in his science of logic. Yes. And the, uh, you know, the real manifest, manifestation of life in the plane of nature. The real the philosophy of nature. What is actually do you can you make what uh, make it, what could Hegel considers the difference between these two? What uh, is the uh, two separate discussions, so to speak? What makes the difference between the logical idea of life and the real the, and, and life, the organism, yeah, in yeah. the philosophy of nature, the real philosophy? What makes what does he emphasize as the difference between these two? Do you know? Well, I, I mean, you're, it's a, it has to do with what is Hegel's logic, really, right? And how does it relate to, um, basically, the concept and its reality as I see it. Extended, extended things, um, and um, I think the short answer would be that Hegel's logic is about God, 
and consequently, um, uh, and God is God had better be alive, right? <laughs> so in order to understand God, we've got to understand life, just simply as an aspect of theology. And then, uh, secondarily, we have to when we when we turn to um, the extended the realm of space and time, which is nature, um, then we have to look at life as a phenomenon in nature as well. So that's why we have two separate discussions. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, if Hegel makes a specific point as to how to differentiate the two. I mean, like in, in logic, it's there's no, uh, what would you say, Well, you, you call it extension. That would be being for another. That's completely the opposite of itself. Whereas in logic, the other is itself. Uh, itself and its other are identical. In nature, the self and other seem to be show a difference, or at least appearance of differences there. But uh, anyhow, it's a little intricate how Hegel differentiates the two. And of course, it's very involved because the the I for, because life develops in nature even before human human existence. It develops right from the plant, uh, even maybe before that in geology, and then uh, takes a different form as it comes up to the human form, anthropology. So it's very intricate how uh, to understand right. the difference between these two. There's no anthropology in the logic, right? <laughs> no. But there is a, a kind of biology. And in fact, he proceeds from his discussion of life to a discussion of cognition. And from cognition in the absolute idea, you have personality. Yeah. So, um, all the essential features of human experience are there in the logic, but they are um, they're in the logic because they are essential features of the divine. Yeah. As such. And it, you know, and it's, it's very close to as uh, essence and the the uh, the divine, the sacred idea. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, the, the uh, Hegel's logic is not a discussion of abstract thought procedures. It's a discussion of reality, right? The ultimate reality. <laughs> um, and that's why it has to deal with life, cognition, and personality. That's very, close, the ultimate very, reality. Close, very close to the Vaishnava theology. Vaishnava theology that we practice. Is very close to that in that there's a sphere called uh, Krishna Loka or Goloka, Goloka, which is the spiritual transcendentals, you can say the highest sphere, that's, which I, you might consider the life of God, in which everything that's going on there also appears in this world, but in a mundane way, what that's right. in a spiritual way. That's so right. It's there in the Goloka, and then it comes down into this plane in the reflected form as the relationships we have with one another of parenthood or friendship or love these all are reflected in there in the higher higher world also but they're very different one is called prakriti the other is called aprakriti the opposite of prakriti prakriti is material okay it's interesting that there's a a similarity there between i suspect it's very similar yeah <laughs> and you don't hear I mean, I don't hear very much. Maybe Plato discusses this somewhat in his idea of eros, that there is some kind of a, a world of ideas that are that have uh, desire and uh, all the all the feelings that are represented in this world. Also, uh, he may discuss that, but otherwise, philosophers certainly don't broach this subject at all. The activities of the spiritual world, you know. Well, 
I would say that uh, Aristotle does. Um, he has a whole theology. Um, and um, Spinoza does, and Kant does, right? It's only 20th century philosophers who've written off this, this effort, right? Yes. Yeah. And indeed, Whitehead continues that great tradition in the 20th century, but, uh, um, and Michael Polanyi, um, little known, brilliant uh, chemist philosopher, uh, his personal knowledge book concludes with uh, theology. So um, um, it's only in the philosophy departments that these things are no longer studied, you know, in the last, in the last 40, 50 years. If actually Hegel is criticized because he put life in the logical sphere. And oh, yes. they tell, well, you can't put life in a logical sphere. It has nothing to do with logic. <laughs> Depends what you mean by logic, right? I mean, if logic is the study of logos, uh -huh. which is reason, uh -huh. and, and if you think reason is, um, is in reality, and not just in somebody's head, then it's, it's very clear why logic would discuss all the aspects of reason, including life. Isn't that, I think that is clear. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so the, these, these 20th century, you know, from Frege um, and Bertrand Russell, we get this notion that logic is about manipulation of symbols. <laughs> but that's not what it meant, not, not what the word meant for, um, for Hegel or anybody previous to Hegel, including Aristotle. Logic is not about the manipulation of symbols. Logic is about thought. That's why they have confused science with mathematics these days. Mathematics is about symbols and not about real phenomena. <laughs> Oh, and mathematics has its pro is a is part of reality as well. It's not just about symbols, right? Any more than than logic is, but um, the relation between these different aspects of reality is is a real a challenging question. As you said in one of your chapters, <laughs> it is so amazing that that mathematics applies to illuminates. Um, physical reality, what is the relationship? And mathematicians and science and uh, physicists are both <laughs> um, struck by this strange coincidence <laughs> that mathematics is, is uh, applicable, although it isn't developed from observation or experiment at all. So what does it have to do with the world, the physical world? Yes, that's the basic question. Yeah. And that's, of course, that was one that was a um, central issue that Plato was trying to clarify. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But he dealt more with geometry than mathematics. But he is. But Plato dealt more with geometry than mathematics. He tried to see the world geometrically, the elements of the world in ge geometrical forms rather than mathematical terms. So that's a difference. Hegel yeah. also mentions geometry is a more holistic understanding of things than mathematics. Mathematics is more analytic approach. Analytic mathematics. Oh, uh, within mathematics, there is, have you, have you seen um, Paul Redding's new book? I have a not. Conceptual oh. harmonies. I see. Um, Reading is studying what you just outlined, I the diff see. different kinds of mathematics, and the fact that um, uh, Hegel is tuned into uh, a kind of mathematics which is 
not uh, not the dominant kinds recently, uh, but it was very important for Plato, as you say, um, and still important in the. Um, well, I don't think like I would say though that Plato did not deal with mathematics as such, but with geometry, which is different from mathematics in that geometry deals with whole. Mathematics deals with more. Uh, there's a more mechanical process. No, in my life, in my head, um, geometry you know, is part of mathematics. That's the way. They were they were likewise for likewise for reading. Especially with Descartes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He mathematized geometry. It's a tradition, you know, um, commonly commonly called mathematical. <laughs> um, but um, you're right. you're right that uh, there's a there appears to be a. Um, um, at least two quite different trends of thought. Yeah, different concepts. Yeah. Um, yeah, mathematics has been associated with mechanical atomistic thinking. Uh -huh. Analytic mathematics or uh, Cartesian mathematics, perhaps, absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's why, that's why computers, are called computers because they deal with mathematics. They're mechanical mathematical systems, and they're very they're very compatible with machines. Quite it's consistent. Yeah. Itself is a kind of formalistic thinking, very formalistic or mechanical thinking. If it's you can even call it thinking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the relationships that that are formed with numbers are kind of. Uh, you know, have that formalistic, uh, you know, what would you call, I guess, identity theory? A number is a particular number and not another number. Sure. Uh, I gave that example in the, in the book that I wrote of apples. If you have, if you say two apples, then you lose the meaning of apple. Yes. Because two apples, so you mean you take one apple and then the second apple, that's not two apples. Apples are never the same. Absolutely. Are the same, you see. So That's to say right. that one apple plus one apple is two apples, you lose the definition of apple with that. And that becomes a symbol of something abstract, a token for what is really there. Well, mathematics is, goes into an abstraction, a formalistic kind of thinking that doesn't really grasp what the concrete nature of uh, the, uh, the world is. The differentiation that's there, as you call it, the externality of nature, is not grasped by mathematics. You can't. Yeah, I think it's one is one, one is one. No matter how many ones you write down, they're all the same. But in, in nature, there's no, no two things are the same like that. It doesn't bear the same similarity that mathematics has. And you combine one and one and you get two. What's the one? What are the two ones in nature that you're talking about? Right, right. How is it that mathematics applies to apples at all? Well, this is a really challenging question. <laughs> Quantitative, yes, but not at a more fundamental level. Anyhow, that's something that I know many, many scientists and philosophers don't deal with that subject because mathematics has become so all pervading that it's you're considered crazy if you try to, you know, uh, contra, uh, uh, defeat the idea of mathematics as applicability to science. But I also mentioned something about when I was talking about that about Galileo. Galileo was the one who said that uh, mathematics was the li the language of nature. Mm -hmm. But his, if you check his idea the ontological idea that Galileo had of, uh, of nature, he was a person who believed in the prime, and the, uh, what do you call it, the primary qualities and the mm -hmm. secondary qualities. And the primary qualities of matter, as he conceived it, was, was something extended. And that, that was pretty much uh, um, Descartes and all the, the philosophers at that time, they all considered matter as to be extended, res extensus, 
on extended substance. And we can say that's what Hegel's saying also, this, this idea of externality, but not really, there's something much different. To say that matter is extended and to speak of externality are two different things. I say, I think. And uh, so by considering the fundamental things of the atoms or whatever you want to say, the units of reality be, to, to be extended, they immediately take on a mathematical form. Uh, uh, wide, how wide, how you know, deep, how this, how that, you know, measure, measurable properties are associated with matter. Right. This is a complete assumption on the on the part of the uh, uh, an un, unjustified presupposition that the philosophers of that time of Galileo made. Right. And they, they all made that, that assumption that matter was itself uh, uh, extended. <laughs> and well, that's that's what it is by definition. It, yeah. That that's and, what they say. Yes, that's what they say. It, it, by definition. That's what. Hegel doesn't say that. That's what reality, we're just going to define reality as what can be um, uh, measured in those ways. Yeah. That's right. But anyhow, I, I think Hegel gives a slightly very different idea and the idea of externality is different from merely extended matter. Matter is a, a more universal substance than externality, a more fundamental uh, concept in externality. Externality and, and matter are two different things. Uh, they, they, anyhow, they combine like that. Berkeley was was against that idea. He said, if you if you uh, put if you call matter extended or uh, assign a, uh, extension to matter, that's also a mental. Uh, what do you want to call? It? Also a sensuous apprehension of matter. It's a decision about what kind of categories you're going to use and what kind of categories you're not going to use. <laughs> but you know, he said that's also that's also a mental uh, a, a function of our mind to call matter extended is as much a function of our mind. Why to why to say that matter is extended and not say that it has certain qualities of taste, of smell, of other other sensuous qualities. Why not? Uh, why should we say only extension, only spatiality? Is or cognition. Huh? Cognition, anything. You're, yeah. you're defining it as unthinking, right? This is Descartes' primary. So, but, you know, what gives <laughs> us the right to do that? <laughs> what gives the right to do that? Why do they make that, that revolutionary or radical presupposition without any justification? This was the problem, I think. With Galileo and why science has developed as it has, without any uh, mention of qualia, qualities, or uh, purposes, or uh, thought. So many things. That's right. right. Yeah. So you, you know, it's it's there in the development of the history of ideas, how modern science arose and how it made so many mistakes along the way. That's if right. We want to, and if we want to correct those mistakes, we have to study that history, and see what assumptions they made and whether they were justified or not, and how they brought us to the present uh, way we are misconceiving the whole thing. Uh, but that has to be done. The history of science, history of philosophy. So okay. Plato, Plato and Aristotle are not uh, dead dogs. <laughs> not dead dogs, not Yeah. And if you if just observe the, um, the um, struggles of people who've been raised in the Galileo and Descartes tradition to understand themselves, they don't even begin to understand themselves. <laughs> and it's pretty obvious. Um, so, um, um, if we want to understand reality as a whole, we better understand ourselves, right? Yes. Above all else, know thyself. Know to Soto. Absolutely. Know <laughs> thyself. <laughs> so, so, 
we're, we're, uh, I think Krishna Keshava was talking about the unity of science and religion. Mm -hmm. How do they, these two intersect? Or uh, how can we see them as uh, intertwining rather than being op opposed or uh, um, indifferent to each other? And uh, there, I think the the the, the, cent the center point for union is found in the study in the scientific study of life. Uh, when we study the organism or living entity, then science has to change its categories. It has to uh, because it recognize if you recognize a living organism, as I think he was explaining about the the various uh, advancements in biology that have been made. In study of the organism, I mean, it's quite amazing. It seems like there's cognition at every level of the organism, even at the most elementary, you know, poly uh, uh, polycarbonate uh, molecule. It seems that they know what they're doing, <laughs> and they make intelligent decisions about what to do next, and how to combine with one another. I mean, this is as, in, as possible to explain things in those terms nowadays. So, but how is that, uh, you know, how to work that out in detail? I think your idea of the uh, true infinite uh, is, is, important, is important for understanding what life is and what it does, why it does what it does. Because, you know, the-, the Fundamental. Huh? It's fundamental. It's fundamental, it seems to me, yes. Yeah. yeah. I was, um, you know, your your book is so full of rich ideas. <laughs> um, I I would have liked to see a little more Hegel in it, if possible. But I know that's uh, very difficult to do in a short book. Yeah, I, I and uh, you know, I am not a great Hegel scholar you know, by any means. You're you're more you have dealt more into the depths of it than I have. I mean, I can understand some of the many of the different ideas in a very, you know, uh, superficial way, you could say, or uh, I have some intuitive understanding, but to explain them in detail is a little bit more difficult. It takes a lot of work to do that. Anyway, I'm just putting yes. I'm just putting out ideas there, a general outline, you might say, so that people who do get into this more deeply they will be able to follow some of the ideas there and put together a more detailed account of what's going on. Oh, I think it's a, uh, a lovely um, introduction to all sorts of of um, major yeah. major concepts. So, what, so what you've written, idea of the unity of religion and and science. How do you think that can be? I think you mentioned you wrote a paper on this. Uh, uh, every, almost everything I write is about that one way or another. Yeah. Um, I mean, I um, when science considers itself, I mean, this is the topic of your conferences, right? If uh, science actually considers the scientist and the thought that scientists are engaged in, it can no longer be mechanistic or materialistic. It's got to um, recognize that that thought is ultimately more what it's concerned with than matter. Matter is a, or, and mechanisms are an interesting feature of the world, but, you know, we can't, we can't assume that, that that's what the world as such is, and we've got to look at our, at what we ourselves are engaged in, in thinking about matter, etc. cetera. Um, and when we think about what we ourselves are engaged in, we're thinking about something that is, um, more more itself more self-determining 
than mechanistic mechanisms are. And mechanisms aren't self-determining. <laughs> thought is, thought is self-determining because it's never satisfied with anything less than, than complete coherence. So if that's what thought is, then we've identified something more, when is what? More, um, that's more itself than any mechanism can be. And what is the ultimate that is completely itself? That's God. So that's how um, a self-reflexive science, a science that studies itself, would be led to God. Spiritual side. The that's spiritual the, side. That's the short version. <laughs> the longer version you find in, in Whitehead and in, and in Hegel and in Aristotle. You have anything? I wanted to uh, contribute one thing, slightly picking up from uh, where we were talking about before between the relationship of subject and object, the interpenetrating relationship between subject and object, and how that is in nature. Um, that one article on biogenesis, right, where we discussed uh, Robert Lanza. Robert Lanza is uh, a super um, well established scientist who used to be a stem cell research and contributed much to stem cells and and now he's dealing much with quantum theory and he he recognizes this pivotal uh importance of the observer effect so this is central to this idea that the subject and object have this dialectic interpenetrating relationship the observer effect that at the quantum level the the, the wave collapses to a particle when the observe when it's observed when it's not observed, it's not a particle, it's a wave. As Maharaj explains on the, on the universal scale, he says the universal wave function has to be observed on the universal level in order to become uh, particles of matter that constitute a universe. On the universal, the universal wave function needs to be collapsed. So this Robert Lanza, to this very day, he just published a, a paper with some like super wild, you know, things in a very well accepted journal of physics, uh, astrophysics journal, about how in an experiment, in, in their experimentations, they're showing that uh, space, how space is collapsing, you know, is, is becoming, uh, how space is manifesting from the wave to the particle from the observer. And, and how that happened in their experiment is, you know, delineated in this paper. And so, uh, on the same blog that this study is being published in the spiritualscience.substack.com, uh, we, we wrote one paper called Biogenesis, um, the law of biogenesis, life and matter come from life. And we talk about Robert Lanz's work there and we you know, have the links to the paper uh, that he wrote. And it's central to this uh, subject object relationship, the dialectic subject object relationship that Hegel is talking about you know, showing that in modern science, I think that's uh, important. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, since the, since the birth of quantum mechanics, this whole issue has been um, occupying people who want to understand quantum mechanics, right? What is the relation between the observer and the observed? Um, and um, um, it sounds as though um, experimentation on on uh, entanglement has really uh, quantum entanglement has, has has really returned the whole discussion to um, um, make made it hard for um, um, physicists to say, well, we're just going to calculate. We're not going to understand, right? <laughs> Which is the the common inter common response to uh, to uh, quantum mechanics. Just do the, do the math and don't try to understand it. <laughs> um, um, but if uh, if entanglement is real, 
uh, in an experimentally demonstrable way, um, what are we, what does that show us about externality? It seems to say, seems to imply that the, uh, the physical world is not composed of mutually external objects, right? As it's, we've assumed ever since Galileo and Descartes that that's what the physical world is. But um, entanglement seems to say, no, there, nothing is mutually external. <laughs> I mean, this is... Um, Um, I'd like to I'd like to see your uh, uh, your discussion of those articles and uh, and uh, learn more about the topic. So Hegel is basically saying that every so-called part of nature is connected with every other part of nature. I think in one one I don't remember where I saw it. But I think you said something like, if you were to remove one part of nature from existence, the whole universe would collapse. Is so this that, the, um, the physicist we were just talking about? Sorry, no, no, I'm talking about Hegel. You're talking about Hegel. <laughs> Hegel said something like this, that if you were to remove one particle of the universe, the whole thing would collapse because each part is related to the other, the other parts. Is defined by those the other parts. Oh, he certainly thinks that. Yes. Is that yeah. is, is that what your idea? Is that what your understanding of what Hegel is saying? <clears throat> um, he's definitely saying in the encyclopedia in detail that um, the exter externality of the supposed externality of physical objects is not the ultimate reality. Um, I mean, he wouldn't even entertain the possibility of removing some part of physical reality uh, because the whole of physical reality is summed up in absolute spirit, which is a return to the absolute idea, which is beyond space and time, so it's not no longer no longer mutually external. So um, so what he has to tell us about um, the supposed externality of objects in space and time, including you and me right? and himself and his predecessors, um, we are not um, ultimately separate. The ultimate reality is beyond space and time. And so whatever, in, in whatever way you and I are real, we too are beyond space and time. Right. I Definitely. imagine that sounds a good deal like Vedanta. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 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 The, the thing is, Hegel criticized empiricism, the empirical thinking, for this very for this very fact that not only is the are the laws separate or conceived as separate from that over which they are governing, but see. That the particularity of the, of the points or the data that we can call it, which uh, empiricism deals with, the data themselves are not related to each other. So the data are neither related to the law which governs them, nor are the data themselves related to each other. He said, this is one of the, one of the defects or two of the defects of the empiric empirical approach. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, you make a law like uh, E equals MC squared or whatever. That seems to govern matter, but the material, it's, it's not shown how that relationship is established. 
it seems to me establish uh, what would you say um, a fortiori, a fortiori is that the right word? You know, they just state it, and uh, but don't explain how the how the law connects with that which is which is governing. Like for instance, when they do a uh, when they study the astro uh, astronomical movements of the stars and so forth, or any any uh, uh, point moving in the skies, they'll lay it out, lay the data out on a on a sheet of paper with different points, and then they try to find the smoothest curve that would that would connect those points. And that curve would be called the law governing those points. Mm -hmm. I mean, a very external process doesn't show the internal connection between the points and the line that that's connecting them, or that's con uh, associated with them, supposedly predicting their appearance. And that was one problem he pointed out. But then the other problem is that he said the points themselves don't show any connection with each other. Uh, they don't show, they don't reveal their uh, integral relationship. Yes, well, I'm, I must admit that I'm not as thoroughly familiar with um, Hegel's discussion of physics as I'd like to be. I think he's he's uh, making points. He's saying the kind of thing you're you're saying. Yeah. And I would like to understand better how he unfolds those issues definitely yeah, that in the uh and that's very nicely he does that in the introductory section of the of the encyclopedia logic he goes over the different points of the uh, attitude i think both attitude toward objectivity they like mm -hmm. that. very nice that's a very nice cup uh summary of that's some wonderful. ideas some say that that Introduction replaces the phenomenology as an introduction to a system. Informally, yeah. informally, yeah. yeah. I mean, he doesn't present it. He doesn't claim that it's a systematic yeah. presentation. It's just another introduction. Yeah. Um, yeah, excuse me, I'm wandering here. <laughs> yeah. So what you were just explaining about how the law is applied to the behavior in a very external way, right. this is exactly what Werner Heisenberg is saying. He says, science is what we can say about nature, not what nature is in itself. Okay. So he points to this exactly, making this distinction between, I think, phenomenal and noumenal, right? Uh -huh. But then, so that begs the question, uh, science the empirical process is largely, uh, especially in the Vedantic teachings, what we call it, it's, it's a, an attempt at an ascending process, trying to know reality, trying to know the infinite solely from the finite's own capacity. Uh, and then, so that begs the question, you know, about revelation. Well, how is the infinite revealing itself? So the, the law of the curve is the finite trying to describe the infinite by its own power, but then can the infinite reveal itself? And what kind of knowledge does that result in? Is that more holistic, more, you know, obviously, it, it, what, what does that mean? Or what is the necessity of that kind of revelation or descending knowledge from the finite to the infinite, uh, from the infinite to the finite? And Werner Heisenberg points it out very specifically. And, and he said it's because of the, he said it's because of the Descartes, you know, separation of mind and matter. Um, oh. He said that's well. He said that's why people like Einstein couldn't accept the Copenhagen version of mm -hmm. a quantum uh, theory because of the Cartesian petition. But he said, pretty uh, like a blanket statement about science itself that you know it's just what we can say about nature. It's just the finite approaching the infinite. Yeah. But that begs the question: then, okay, can the infinite reveal itself? What is that about? And how? Is that scientific also? I think what um, Hegel and Plato 
and Aristotle want us to understand is that we experience infinity. It's in our experience. It's not a separate um, domain. That is, if it were separate, it wouldn't be infinite. That's that's Hegel's um, critique of the spurious, the, the false infinity, the bad infinity. So um, uh, we experience infinity and, and the uh, simplest way in which we do experience infinity is in our experience of our efforts to be free and to think beyond our limitations. And we're, we're making those efforts constantly because we're always trying to, um, to figure out <laughs> what would actually be good in the given circumstances um, or what would, uh, what's actually true in the given circumstances. And, and that means in order to figure out anything of that nature, we have to go beyond um, our mere desires and our mere opinions. Um, this is what Kant describes as, as um, rational self-government, autonomy. Um, it's what Plato describes in the in the ascent from the cave. We're trying to get beyond um, our mere hunches and our mere desires towards something more ultimate. And that the fact that we are doing that is our experience of infinity, of going beyond the finite. And it's consequently, that's the, you know, the infinite is not um, beyond us. It's we are we are participating in it. That's the way in which the divine and the the um, the mundane are connected. That's the way God is in the world. So if somebody can spell out how that that uh, simple line of thought applies to or is is also present in the discussions of of quantum mechanics uh, they will have done a great service i think we will be seeing uh we'll be seeing an intersection of of uh, theology and and physics could we say something about the uh, the difference between trying to overcome one's own limitation just based on some ambiguous internal motivation where, although like you said, the finite is always participating in the infinite, whether it's conscious of the infinite or not. So it's capacity and desire to grow is a manifestation of that, trying to go beyond what it currently is, but still it, the finite may still be unconscious of the infinite where God in, in a very clear, in a very, as a self-conscious thinking being. There's so, and how to speak about going beyond one's limitations, being conscious that the infinite is what we are participating in and that that infinite is self-conscious thinking being. The one is we're trying to grow, but we don't know the context in which we're growing. And the other one is we're trying to grow and we have some hint of that context uh, as self-conscious thinking being, as God, as substance and subject, the absolute being substance and subject. So one, we're not conscious of the context at all, but we still have some impetus to go in a certain direction. And the other one, we're more conscious of that and we're very much hankering for that development. Uh, could you restate that as a question? Yeah. So <laughs> what is, um, 
what would Hegel say is the difference between these two forms of personal development, between these two forms of the finite participating in the infinite inherently? The first being unconscious of the infinite and its qualities, yet still having desire to grow. And the second being somewhat conscious of the infinite and its qualities and having the desire to grow in relation to that. What would the approach to these two different personal development paths uh, be? I don't know if that was clear. <laughs> Um, uh, do you have in mind the fact that uh, so many scientists, for example, seem to be unconscious of the way in which they are um, transcending the physical world? This is certainly true. I mean, this is, uh, <laughs> Hegel says in, the, in his discussion of the finite that um, it's the, um, it's the most stubborn obstacle, <laughs> the finite. The finite always wants to think of itself as finite, but um, so how does, how does consciousness um, become aware? How do we become conscious? of the fact that we are we're engaging in a kind of transcendence really that's um i suppose in many different ways but the 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 the, the key thing is that we think about our own thought and not only about extended things, material me mechanisms and so forth. Uh, if we seriously think about our own thought and our own learning processes, um, it can dawn on us that what we're doing is not just um, pushing material objects around, what we're doing is not just seeking to uh, feed, you know, find a way of feeding ourselves and and uh, extending our life and time. What we're doing is looking for truth. Um, as Plato says in. Plato says in um, uh, book five, I think, of the Republic, uh, everybody wants what's really good and not just what they currently think is good. Right? <laughs> Nobody would be satisfied to think, oh, I'm going to get everything that I want right now. Um, that's not what we really want. What we really want is what we ought to want, right? What's really, what would really be good for us. So um, we are inherently um, pursuing something that goes beyond what we currently desire and think. That's just um, seems to be built into us. And that's the transcendence. That's wanting to go beyond um, what our genetic heritage and our environment have programmed into us. We want, we, we do not want to assume that what's really good is merely whatever we've been programmed to want. That would be saying, oh, um, I'm satisfied to be a machine. 
Well, I'm not satisfied to be a machine. <laughs> and I haven't yet met anybody who will answer Plato, Plato's question by saying, no, I just really want what I want. I don't care whether it's good or not. Nobody who thinks about the issue ever responds that way. And that means that we are all entangled in this process of trying to get beyond our current opinions and our current desires. We're all engaged in that, whether we admit it to ourselves or not. And that's what religion is about, getting beyond. It's about whatever it is that goes beyond these merely finite mechanical processes. Have you ever heard the saying that the beyond is not some other world? It's just this world properly understood. Absolutely. <laughs> That's Hegel. <laughs> yeah. And if it's merely beyond, who cares? You know, that's not what we're interested in. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm have we turned over enough stones? <laughs> have we touched on the big issues that you wanted to touch on? We certainly can't hope to resolve them, but it's been, been, uh, been a lot of fun for me. <laughs> it's not so nice seeing you and talking with you, Bob. Lovely to see you, Dr. Puri. Yes. All right, we hope everything will go well for you. Maybe we'll see you again soon. We're gonna have another conference this year. Or maybe online this time, virtual conference, science and scientists we hold every year. We haven't made any definite plans yet. But well, keep me informed, please. If you like, yes, you're welcome to participate. And uh, Krishna Kashaba, thank you so much for your making this happen and your very probing questions. You, um, if you want to correspond at any point, just uh, let me know and, and uh, I'll try to respond. You very generous. Very generous. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Namaste. Take care. You too. And also.